Well, my dear friends, this has been a wonderful day of worship and celebrating God's grace among us. And we will come to the Lord's table today and celebrate the fact that God's table is open to all of God's children. And God's table is long and wide. And we will celebrate at the end of Holy Communion two persons who will be joining in membership with this congregation as they celebrate the inclusivity and the love they have seen in this congregation. But you know, as I celebrate the beauty in this congregation, I'm reminded of what Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in 1963 and how true it is for so much of the world today. He stated, we have learned to fly the air like birds and swim the sea like fish, but we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers and sisters. My dear friends, we are making strides in learning how to live together. We are moving more and more into looking like the beloved kingdom that God has called us to be. For we are called to realize that God shows no favoritism at all. Yet every day, I hear of different groups who claim favoritism with God or who presume that God will shine light upon them, their group, or their favorite sports teams above others. Isn't it true? We pray for our team to beat the other team. We pray for our nation to be the best nation. We pray for our own particular group to be more favored. In the Old Testament times, that was a very strong belief, a belief of the Hebrew children that they were God's favorite and that God didn't care about the rest of the world. And that's why this particular scripture passage that was read for us today is one that I wanted to lift up for us. It is so impressive to me because in the story of Rahab and the Israelites, Rahab is the only one of the Canaanites who is spared as the Israelites go into the city. Rahab and all of her family members because Rahab reached out to the Israelites herself as they came to spy on the city of Jericho as you heard, she hid the spies on the roof of her house, and she told the authorities that they had already left. She put her own life in danger to spare those foreigners because she saw them as followers of the one true God. Even though she was a Canaanite, and most Canaanites believed in the, prophet, in the god Baal, she recognized that the God that the Israelites worshipped is the one true God of heaven and earth. And when the walls of Jericho fell, Rahab and her household were, spa were spared. It's interesting to note that Rahab's name itself means to be open wide, accepting, and to offer spacious space. For that is exactly what she did for those spies. She joined God's movement of opening up our understanding that we are all God's children. And I can say that because Rahab is one of those Old Testament women whose name is not just given to us once, but her name is repeated three more times in the scriptures. Three times we are referred to Rahab and her story in the New Testament. And the first of those times is in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew. At the very beginning of Matthew's Gospel, we read that Rahab, the young woman who came from the despised Canaanites, is included in the genealogy of Jesus. 
the presence of Rahab's name in Matthew's genealogy at the very beginning of the New Testament symbolizes and impresses upon our minds that God is always at work and always has been at work in expanding the universality of God's love and God's grace, reaching out to include all people. And yet we know that in our world today, we continue to seek to classify, limit, divide, restrict, confine, belittle, and label others. In our nation, there is grave concern about the increase in the number of hate crimes, especially those resulting from race and sexual orientation. But we also know that persons with differing abilities are often labeled with unflattering and hurtful names. One of the greatest lessons in the Apostle Paul's life and in his writings was his discovery that Jesus Christ tells us there are no boundaries to God's love and God's grace. We all likely have learned that verse that the apostle wrote many years ago saying that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor free, female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus, heirs according to the promise. And because Paul understood that, he reminds us in 2 Corinthians 5.18 that God has given to all of us a ministry of reconciliation to break down those walls that separate us, those walls that we have built up, those walls that we have bought into because of our cultural settings, to break down every human barrier between us and every obstacle that divides us from loving and receiving accepting and affirming one another, expanding boundaries and removing barriers and being involved in the ministry of reconciliation is our God-given task. But it is risky, and it is serious business. It got Jesus into a lot of trouble, didn't it? It led him to a cross. There are many who are not rejoicing today about the decisions that came out of the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. And we will likely hear people call us names and tell us that we are not true followers of Jesus Christ because of the decisions that have been made by our General Conference. My dear friends, be brave and courageous like Rahab and trust in the Lord our God and in the gospel message that in God there is no favoritism, that all are welcome at God's table, all are welcomed into God's grace and God's love. Many years ago, some of you will recall, in 1998, the brutal murder of Matthew Shepard. Matthew was a gay American student at the University of Wyoming he was beaten and tortured and left to die on October the 6th, 1998. He was taken by rescuers to a hospital in Colorado, but he died six days later from severe head injuries received during that attack. There was a great outpouring of grief and pain and anger across the country as massive numbers of people gathered together in vigils and memorial services to comfort one another and express their outrage at that heinous crime of hate. One would think and hope that the hate had ended that day, but it did not. And yet, I recall that at the memorial service that was held, for Matthew Shepard, there was a beautiful story told by the pre preaching professor of the United Methodist Isle of School of Theology in Denver. He preached a resurrection service for Matthew Shepard, and he told about a poignant event that took place when he was in the second grade. He said, the children 
on the playground were playing a game called You're Out, You're Out, You Can't Come In. I think that was something like Red Rover, Red Rover, send someone right over. And you remember how you held your hand so tight and you didn't want the person to break through? He said he was always one on the outside. You're out, you're out, you can't come in. He was always on the outside. But one day when they were playing that game, a little girl named Louise, one of the girls who was always in, gave him a wink. And as he ran towards that line to break through and the children were shouting, you're out, you're out, you can't come in, Louise dropped her hand and allowed him in. As soon as he joined that link of children together, the little boy whose hand Louise had dropped started yelling at her, and he said, You can't do that. If you do that, everybody will come in. And she smiled with a big grin and said, I know. The pastor that day said, God is like Louise, or better yet, Louise was expressing God's love and God's grace. As we come to the table today to receive the bread and the cup, hear once again that this is Christ's table, and Christ bids all of us to come to share in the gift of forgiveness and new life, and joy, and hope, and peace, the gifts of God's amazing, and abounding, and steadfast love for you, and for me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.